Okay, uh, so obviously um, I'm Craig, hello. I'm in between jobs at the moment. I uh, have been a tech recruiter for, um, for 20 years. The last five, six have been purely in digital, uh, focusing primarily on UI, UX and product. Um, as a consequence, I uh, know um, Alex through various conversations we've had in the past uh, regarding the industry. Um, Alex has kindly agreed to um, be the first of hopefully many interviews that I'm going to be doing with people in um, the industry about the uh, impact of, of COVID-19, different ways of working, thoughts on leadership, uh, parenting and, and returning to a, a new normal. Um, so Alex, if you wouldn't mind giving us a bit of a, a brief overview about you. Sure. Um, yeah, so I am the uh, head of UX, UI and product at uh, WM Reply. Um, yeah, WM Reply is uh, one of the uh, multiple companies within uh, Reply, which is a global um, consultancy and supplier of uh, development design, uh, just about everything across um, technology. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, WM Reply is uh, one of those companies as part of a network model, uh, each with a particular specialism, and uh, ours is uh, both Microsoft uh, products, Office 365, SharePoint, um, modern workplaces, and then uh, my side, which is uh, customer and, and user experience. So, um, yeah, big website builds, apps, uh, design, and, and UX. Okay. So, in terms of your role and responsibilities, you are currently managing a team of, of, of how many? And is that a kind of a UK or disparate model? Yeah, so it depends. It depends how you cut it. Um, I think at the moment we're we're looking at forty five um, within within my team, and that's that's across uh, development, uh, design, and research. Um, I focus more on the design and research side, which is a slightly smaller part of that team. Um, but we all work together as one one uh, one business unit um, within within the company. So um, yeah, yeah, it's a it's a multi multidisciplinary team and uh, it's distributed as well. So um, yeah, I've got uh, team members that are in uh, London, Chester, Manchester, uh, Minsk and Chicago. OK, so uh, here's the kind of crux of the question. How has coronavirus affected the business of a whole? How has that filtered down to your team? Um, and how have you managed to keep the wheels turning during this time? Um, I mean, to be honest, we've we've, we've been you know, pretty fortunate. Um, that's not to say that we haven't been affected. Uh, we we have. Um, the way the way to really look at it, I mean, without without going into specifics, is that uh, yeah, this this has hit everyone. Just about every sector has been affected in some way, um, some more than others. And yeah, we're we're really fortunate to have a have a quite broad client base. So. Um, you know, we felt that through our clients, you know, our clients uh, uh, difficulties and challenges are, uh, are ours. There, there are challenges as well. Um, so in that way, we, we have felt it. Um, but I think, you know, more than anything, it's, it's the change in way of working that we've all, I mean, again, very fortunately adapted immediately for remote working, but it is a change. I mean, whether it works or it doesn't work, it's still a big shift. Um, we're used to working together. I think that affects design um, pretty significantly as well. Uh, designers like to collaborate and work in, in a room together. Um, and so we've had to adapt quite quickly on that. But uh, yeah, I think I think the upside actually, um, you know, there are, there are, few, there are very few but um, the upside is that having a distributed team all working remotely is, you know, we've we've all kind of started working in one environment. We've, that, the, the differences between where we're located have become irrelevant, really. We're all, we're all working together um, without any without any distance. So, you know, there is there is a little bit of an upside there as well. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's been a it's been a rapid shift. OK, uh, and in terms of um... The plan for 2020, a number of businesses that, that I've spoken to have kind of ripped up second year plans and more about kind of man maintaining. Or there are other businesses that I'm talking to that um, 
have uh, seen demand increase because of the areas that they're in. Now, whether that's uh, medtech, martech, edtech, has there been any significant shift in client demand or uh, priorities for you guys, or has it just been you know more of the same but with bigger challenges? Um, it really is something that that changes depending on uh, on the sector that the clients are working with them. Um, I, I wouldn't say there's specific cases of uh, increased demand, but there's definitely. Um, I, I think I think that one of the initiatives that a lot of businesses are having are preparing themselves for an unknown future. Like that's one of the the key drivers behind everything that uh, a lot of a lot of businesses are, are doing to protect themselves. Um, you know, so obviously there was that period immediately after the you know the news hit and everyone started realizing at, at slightly different times how serious this was. Um, and you know, people were a little bit more reserved with what they were doing and maybe holding back until they they knew what was happening. But I think everyone has settled in now to the idea that it is uncertain for a while, and having that preparedness for you know whatever is to come um, is a priority. Mm. So it's, it's it's not a specific priority, but I think across all sectors. Um, being prepared for, uh, you know, being being agile and being able to change and adapt for what they need, um, being reactive to whatever changes happen, like that is something that that some businesses are more capable at than others. Um, and so, yeah, I think if there if there's any running thread, it would be that. Okay. And how has your role changed as a consequence? Um. I mean, it hasn't really changed. I, I did, I did worry that, um, you know, I, I love my team, and uh, you know, professionally and personally, they're, they're you know, they're, they're, they're close friends, and it's about making sure that everyone is um, dealing with this, both in terms of their change of the way of the, they're working, but also their mental health. Um, I know, you know, I've struggled. And I don't think that's that's something that anyone would uh, pretend otherwise about at the moment. You know, it, it's it's definitely difficult being home all the time, um, for some more than others. Uh, and you know, it's hard to concentrate on what you're doing when there's a global pandemic going on, right? Like that's that's not something that you, that, that everyone can just ignore. So, yeah, I, I did worry that you know a big part of what I would have to be doing would be focusing on the mental health of everyone that I'm working with, but. Um, yeah, I've, if anything, I've just seen, I've just seen motivation, you know, uh, more than ever. Like it, it's it's not been a problem. Um, I think yeah, mental health is be, is being affected. People are getting a little bit stir crazy now and then, and you know, it's important to try and have these little sessions to keep everyone feeling connected. Um, but yeah, motivation, not that's not been a problem. Everyone, if if anything, people are more motivated to to you know prove that this works well and to make the most out of the time that we have yeah well we're considering you know london the uk but london especially is uh, at the for forefront of the tech industry the actual take up on you know digital workforce optimization about flexible working hours about you know true trust uh, in the working environment you know it it's been incredibly slow um in terms of clients wanting to adopt that um so what i'm hoping that we'll see from this is that you know d despite people's misgivings people do want to work hard people do want to be productive uh, and there will probably be a very very high percentage of those that have actually taken um the initiative to prove that you can be you know both collaborative and productive whilst working from the comfort of your home. Um, whether it's a comfort, being locked down for two months is a, is a different matter, but I see it as being um, enabling. Yeah, I there's been a lot of news about this recently, hasn't there? I mean, things like, um, you know, uh, Twitter and and, uh, and Google and the way that the way that they've been addressing, you know, the changes that they're going to implement after all this. Um, I before before uh, joining reply um 
uh, nearly three years ago. Uh, I was I had my own startup, and then before that, I was with a with a startup. Um, so I think that had quite an effect on me. And one of the terms that that came from that period of time was uh, output over input, um, meaning that you know a, a good team, a productive team, a team that that you can really trust your your kind of your dream team is one that that watches the clock because they need more time rather than they're waiting for the end of the day and um you know i i i, I personally believe in that very um very deeply that uh if you're hiring the right team if you've got the right people in place and you've got the right motivation um in there then yeah your your working hours are irrelevant your location is irrelevant um as long as you can facilitate the ways that you work and you have the workflows in place then uh, you know your your delivery should be unaffected and you might actually get more out of your team because you're not wasting time with things like commuting the problem is though is that as a as a consultancy we are beholden to our clients in the ways that they would like to work and so we can't just you know it's not something that um it's not really for me to say either but it's um i think it's something to watch in the industry for sure um but yeah there's I mean, in my role specifically, there's nothing like FaceTime, right? You need you need to be there and and uh, communicating in person. And um, I don't think that'll ever completely d disappear from the the kind of agency setting. Um, so yeah, I don't I don't see it being a massive impact on us. I think m perhaps you know perhaps slightly more remote working, but we already we already uh, allowed that before. Um, to, to some degree, depending on on role and the kind of work you do, um, you could have a certain amount of time working remotely if if there was uh, if that was required in any way. So, yeah, I don't I don't see it having a, a huge effect apart from perhaps maybe a little bit of an increase in remote working, but not a replacement. And, and how um, have you done anything differently to keep the team uh, feeling con connected, uh, productive? Uh, motivated? Are there any kind of social initiatives um, that you've introduced or any kind of, for want of a better terminology, controls so that you can see the effectiveness of, of how people are being? Um, so, uh, kind of two-part answer. So, controls for measuring effectiveness. Um, not so much. I don't think we've needed to. Um, we're all, I mean, no, no one's working uh working as a as an island there's um as i mentioned i already trust the team fully and implicitly everyone is uh, motivated and hard working so that's not been something i've had to try and implement um i used to be a developer and i've been implementing a lot of design operations processes that m mirror development um which incidentally allows for a lot of that tracking as well so you have uh, commit based designs and you can see you know what's been committed and when and what, what the changes are um and it, yeah it's more for more for tracking and uh collaboration and growing the team at scale than it is for attribution yeah um so that's not really yeah that's not really a worry for me on on, on the first part um yeah it's super key to uh, have frequent updates and stand-ups uh, and uh, get the team together even if there's nothing uh, immediate to be discussing there's no you know project that we all need to get together for um just having an update having an all hands i think um really important at the moment so i've definitely increased that so that you know even if there's no other reason um we definitely all get on a call together at least once a week um and then yeah we do little things like virtual coffee breaks in the afternoon just to have an opportunity to chat about something other than work for 15 minutes um and yeah and then also we have you know the the typical meetings that we would have had before to get everyone together um we have those virtually now and you know followed by a few beers and some quizzes or things like that you know so we, we we try and do that it's no substitute for it definitely but it's yeah i think it's really important okay so is there any kind of um visibility on the return to work for the team uh have, have reply kind of is it a suck it and see scenario with with uh, the, the government or are you 
Have you set a date on a return? So it, officially, we're following the the government's advice. Okay. Um, and yeah, being 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 reactive to that per location. So um, you know the situation is different depending on the office. So we can't um, we can't have a kind of a blanket approach to it. Uh, and it's also you know it's a requirement for um, having various levels of senior staff within the office if we were to have people coming in so you know it, it, it's more of a case-by-case -case basis at the moment that we will roll out but we're being incredibly cautious and uh we've implemented um you know every every possible precaution uh and, and safety measure in in the offices that do open um limiting a maximum of 50 percent in each scenario so yeah there's a lot a lot of thought a lot of care being taken over to, uh, taken to how we approach that Mm. Good book because I, I imagine people are desperate to to get back in as soon as is safe to do so um, because it's all very well and good being remote and working from home and having that freedom and additional time and quality of life but um, a lot of us myself included are kind of missing that the human contact um, and the, the kind of freedom that the uh, uh, bizarrely the um the commute to work and uh, being in an office environment gives you yeah yeah I, mean, I think the commute part is the tricky bit right it's the office you can take as many precautions as you like but you know the, the public transport um aspect in uh, london you know more than anywhere else it's yeah. it's really hard to avoid and a lot of people cannot get to work without public transport so um I think that's going to be the trickiest part is that even doesn't matter what we do if public transport is an issue that's going to affect us so okay. i think that'll be the case for everyone so uh, as we start to come out of this uh, period of enforced isolation what do you think we can take from it what what will of the uh, creative or tech industry have learned from this and and and, and where do we go and i know that's the kind of uh, six million dollar question um yeah that's that's a big question i i don't know um i think that as long as uh as long as other other ex examples of of um teams like like my own uh have been adapting well to this increased remote um working environment and workflow um if they've been doing that right, then they'll see the benefits of that for keeping that um, go forward. I think that uh, a lot of design teams are still quite reactive and they are uh, seen as a as a service for the organization. Um, whereas, you know, development teams are, are more typically uh, working on on programs and, uh, you know, in an agile methodology. So I think maybe there'll be more of a shift of design towards that type of process um and i think yeah across the board you are definitely going to see more people working remotely as as uh, you know the costs of offices become uh, less and less necessary yep um so there'll definitely be a, sh a shift towards that um and also you know modern workplaces so having all file storage in the cloud being able to collaborate and communicate really quickly and effectively um, you know examples like Microsoft Teams the adoption of that being taken up uh, more rapidly I think it is it'll be a bit of a, a you know um, it'll be a bit of a boost to what would have happened naturally anyway yeah uh, but definitely a push towards those kind of technologies and, and ways of working Okay. And that's that's what we'll notice more than anything, and and then uh, definitely certain uh, sectors as well will be affected more than others. I mean, if you look at sectors like retail um, and the the forced adoption of online shopping that has happened with um, uh, older clients, uh, older customer segments, for example, that that maybe were more hesitant to push, and they've they've now become you know required to try online shopping and might uh, stick with it. Yep. So I think there'll be, yeah, there'll be an effect on the ways of working, but definitely on the on the consumer side as well, for sure. Um, so uh, again, this is kind of a little bit divergent, but um, you were talking about 
uh, UX kind of working closely with tech. Uh, and, and I see that there is kind of a, a more of a, a, a merging and certainly blurred line for me with UX and product design. Mm -hmm. um, for, for the benefit of, of, of laymen, so i.e. me, um, what, what is the distinction? How, how are they, you know, how are they different and how are they becoming more the same? So it's absolutely fair to uh, conflate them because I think people within the industry do as well. Um, it's the way I can give you my, my opinion on it, which is that product is um, a three pillar idea of um, uh, development, business and user. Uh, and then user and business, um, you know, are, are sometimes quite difficult to differentiate as well, um, but not always. So for me, a product team focuses on the business objectives, the technical feasibility and effort that's required to um, to develop something, uh, and then the user's needs and delight in what is being built. Um, and, and it's those three pillars uh, being considered together as a whole that uh, enables the prioritization of um, ongoing development or, or new new products. Um, if I give you one example, it's it's not, uh, you know, there's no point investing time into a feature that delights the user but has no impact on the business. Um, and obviously you could argue things like, uh, you know, well, improving the user experience benefits the, the business because it improves the brand recognition and brand uh, perception and, and all those kind of things. And that's why often, you know, improving the user experience does affect the business. Mm. But if there was a, a user experience improvement that didn't affect the business, that would not be worthwhile. And, and uh, you know, on top of that, if it takes a long time to build or is particularly uh, expensive to build, um, then that might not be worth the return as well. So it's, com it's looking at those different facets of a product or a feature um, and, and treating those as, as equal and inter interdependent. Whereas uh, user experience is more focused on the user. So it's uh, usability and um, uh, uh, accessibility, uh, those aspects of um, the user experience without thinking of it from a business perspective. Okay. Um, so there is a lot of crossover. Uh, you can't really think about products without user experience, yep. but you can definitely think about user experience without product. Okay. So, um, and, and again, I'm asking, you know, huge uh, sweeping questions, uh, kind of putting you on the spot a bit. Um, but in terms of how UX design um, has evolved over the last 12 months, where do you see it going? Well, where, where is the kind of client demand focusing from a, um, a UX design perspective? Uh, and where do you think it's going to, to be taken? Um, so I think what we've seen in the last few years is uh, an uptake of design systems being used over um, bespoke designs or just designs based off of you know brand guidelines those types of things so using design systems to facilitate faster design um, and to keep consistency across multiple touch points um, but also uh, to enable for example um, algorithmically generated content and pages that don't require to have a designer look over them, right? The design system helps facilitate those kind of things. So I think that's been a real uptake in recent years. Um, an extension on that, and I think where we're going, is that a design system holds more than just the UI and also holds the user experience. So there would be reuse and uh, a, a system of patterns as well as uh, elements. So, um, ensuring that there are learned behaviors between touch points um, and that the user experience rather than just the look and feel feels consistent no matter what touch point you're you're um, you're looking at so I think I think that might be one of the most significant changes um, and it kind of leads back to what I was saying earlier around like the ways of working um, more process driven uh, I think all, all of those changes are facilitating this more uh, system-based approach to both UX and UI design. Okay. Um, we saw briefly during my time at, at, at Gemini a push for hybrids. 
You know, we want people that are excellent at UX and UI. Do you think mm-hmm. it exists? Um, and is it a model that you would subscribe to or do you very much like them? You know, people that take an interest in both sides, but you want someone that is purely dedicated in UX and, and separate the teams. Um, yeah, I, I think I'm biased in this. Um, I was I was the you know web designer, right, which was absolutely everything under the sun uh, that would relate to the website when I started out. And so, you know, there's a reason why, um, you know, I, I can see the value in that because I'm, I'm talking about myself. Yeah. Um, I then started seeing the industry moving to more specialist roles and I saw multiple arguments for why specialist roles were, were needed. Um, I mean, I'm a big believer in, uh, you know, jack of all trades, master of all trades. Right. I think I do believe in that. I think that the learning curve for most um, most specialisms are uh, quite steep towards the end. And, um, you know, being 90 percent is more than enough to be a very good specialist in any one of those areas. Right? Yeah. So that extra 10 percent um, is quite hard to find. and It's quite hard to, to apply. Um, so. You know, I'm, I'm a fan of having someone that is 90% across a number of different areas. Um, I think that there's a lot of uh, advantages to that as well, um, not only for, uh, you know, changing team structures, being able to utilize uh, every resource and, and uh, you know, keep things interesting and fresh, um, but also from uh, what can apply um, to a different area from something you've learned in something else. So. You know, understanding user research is uh, really important for helping with UX design. And I think, you know, UX design and UI design are totally different things. But there's definitely some benefit to having an understanding of both. It it can't be argued that there isn't a benefit. Um, And and then on top of that, I think that, you know, being a developer or having some understanding, at least, of of front end development makes you a better designer. Um, You know, it gives you gives you more. more experience in what can be done and um you know as long as it doesn't restrict you into thinking that something's too difficult to design um then yeah i think there's a benefit for for all of that so yeah i've got my opinion on it but i do i do respect that it's just an opinion i'm right. sure there are lots of people that could argue for specialists of course. Um, it's probably good to have a mix of both yeah indeed uh, this is a bit of a curveball. You and I, in our previous conversation, you mentioned, um, and I've underlined it, and I reminded myself to throw it back at you uh, during this recording, is um, ethical use of UX. Can you elaborate on that? What, what, what did you mean by it, and, and where do you see that being problematic? Yeah, that's a that's a um, that's a good. And another example of where things might be going in the future in this uh, industry, actually. Um, I think if I could draw a parallel, uh, the way that data became, um, I mean, that was the Web 2.0 thing, right? Everything everything suddenly had an API and there was uh, use of data between every, every different um, application. Uh, and then we started realizing how dangerous that could be. And we started regulating that. So now we have a very uh, well understood uh, regulatory environment around data, you know, with the introduction of GDPR, for example. Um, and if you you compare that to user experience um, or user experience design, should I say, uh, I think it might be a couple of years behind where we're starting to understand things like dark patterns and um, the impact of things like social media, where we're we're using gambling psychology um, and addictive patterns to to influence user behavior. Um, And I think that, uh, yeah, having a, a code of ethics around how to utilize those skills um and utilize that understanding i think that's something that i think we're probably quite a long way off of having that regulated because it's a little um vague and difficult to regulate in comparison to data 
Um, but, but I do think that's something that a lot of organisations will start uh, optionally taking on, that they um, they want to only do good and respect their users and and uh, try not to manipulate in... I mean, it's, it's such a difficult one, right? Because, I mean, sales and marketing, they're all based on psychology and the psychology of manipulation in some shape or form, right? So it's, it's a really difficult one to know where the line is. We don't want to start having ad adverts where people just say, you know, this is a soft drink. It's fizzy. Do you want it? You know, there's got to be some level of psychology to it for it to work. But wielding that in the right way, you know, we already know that you don't target children with um, uh, sweets in the same way that we did in the 90s with those kind of TV adverts, right? Like, like we've taken responsibility in those areas. So I think we're, we're on the verge of having uh, responsibility in things like social media and um, gaming and YouTube, those kind of things. I think that's that's on the horizon and it'll be part of UX to, to figure that out. Right. OK, thank you very much. Um, so I, I know you're um, you're a father. So uh, as a father and a leader and mentor of a, a number of people, how are you finding the balancing act? Um, how are you switching between the two and keeping sane? Uh, so yeah, I'm, I mean, barely keeping sane. It's really difficult. Um, yeah, the the homeschooling aspect is hard. I've got a, a real age gap between my son and daughter, uh, ten and three. So right. yeah, having having a three year old running around whilst homeschooling a ten year old is never going to be easy. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I get to see them more. So there's there's, there's the upside of that, right? I, I get to see them more, which is great. Um, but to be honest, I sympathise for my wife more than I do myself. Right. <laughs> I'm, I'm not the one doing most of it, to be honest. I just feel feel bad about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, I guess same as everyone else, right? In terms of, uh, you know, um, keeping in touch with friends, family, it's your traditional house party, Zoom teams are you still doing that because i know uh, certainly with my family we've all had enough of each other um digitally yeah i think it might have yeah no one said anything but it has died down a little bit <laughs> um yeah i think everyone is getting a little bit tired of the yeah. video calls right but yeah we, we still yeah i still want to have them <laughs> i think at first you know having everyone suddenly available on video call had its uh had its excitement in the first couple of weeks yeah okay um and, and before we go on just a kind of a, a quick overview the, of um some guidance that you can give for, for people that have been uh affected by covid either by furlough or or, or redundancy um a bit of advice on um on, on grooming how are you keeping your hair so good looking man Oh, you. <laughs> um, it took me yeah, 20 minutes of messing around and I'm like, you know, I'm still, oh God, no, should I put that bit there? Yeah, I'm going, I'm going fully long. So yeah, advice is, um, just commit yeah, to maybe, it. yeah, <laughs> own it. <laughs> <laughs> Hairspray and commit to it. All right, fine. Um, so to, 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 to go back to the serious point, um, I want, um to, to be able to provide some kind of guidance for people as i've mentioned i've been doing some pro bono stuff for the past two months whilst i've been on garden leave um talking to candidates that have been made redundant that are just generally feeling insecure about the job market those that have been furloughed and worry about returning i've been looking at their cv i've been looking at their digital footprints their linkedin profile i've been helping them with um kind of interview techniques, kind of providing them with an insight of what recruiters do when we're marketing candidates so that they can do it themselves, right? Um, also opening up my network, connecting people uh, wherever possible. Um, so as someone that has recruited teams and built teams for, for an incredibly long period of time, um, your take uh, and, and, and some advice that you can give people would be incredibly helpful for them. So, look, if you can just talk from a UX perspective, right? What does good look like? You know, what, how do you stand out as a UX candidate? Um, I think it's showing uh, a lot of a lot of uh, candidates have fantastic portfolios. Um, I think it's also a point that you know 
this is the perfect time to be working on that. If you don't have a strong portfolio, get that ready, uh, focus on it, work, and work on some um, exercises or example projects because you know this this is the time to, to be working on that. Um, I think what stands out from a UX point of view is showing the the methodology and the thinking as well as the the outcome right it's it's um it's the part from school that i was never good at which was showing showing your workings out you need you need to to explain the process of how you got to that final outcome um because that's more important than the final outcome when it comes to a good ux designer um I think that's becoming more well known, but there's still still an area that, uh, especially those just coming into the industry, they they might be more focused on the outcome than the process. We're talking case studies, including case studies in the portfolio. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be a perfect case study. It could just be you know a process of a little bit of research, and then how that research was um, uh, utilized in uh, wireframing, and then you know some competitive research. Um, looking at the user flow, thinking about the priorities of user tasks at different stages of the journey, and then how that has informed the designs at the end. You know, rather than thinking this is, you know, this looks good. Uh, it's just understanding that there's a reason behind everything on there. That's that's the key. Okay, um, and if you, uh, I, I suppose it depends on level. You know, designers don't text. Uh, tends to have CVs, those that are kind of in management or leadership um, roles tend to. Um, for you, is it more important, that, that is the portfolio more important than the CV? Uh, and what advice and tips would you give when building a portfolio and or CV? Um, I think if you're going to have any kind of digital um, work, then yeah, having it web based is really useful. Um, build it yourself if you can, like we can we can tell. Um, <laughs> Uh, and that shows an initiative and motivation too. Um, I think the CV, yeah, le less less important. It's more important to know the organisations you've worked worked for before, um, and have some highlights from those organisations and roles uh, that you can call out uh, specifically. Um, and that can all be done on LinkedIn. Uh, you know, for me personally, um, it's a portfolio and a LinkedIn profile um, and a and a good rapport. On, a, on, a, on an introduction call that really gets the ball rolling. So it's, um, yeah, I think the CV is, is less important for me, but I do respect that uh, it, it it does become more important the more um, the more managerial the role becomes, um, where we need a little bit more to read. Okay. Um, and uh, what about the use of, uh, of um, videos in a portfolio or on a website? You know, one of the uh, ideas that we were rolling out previously um, was a 30 second video introduction um, link on the CV or on the portfolio on the LinkedIn. Um, because I think in when, when hiring managers have their own jobs to do, even though recruitment is incredibly, incredibly important, important the time that you've got to commit to that is uh, incredibly limited. And a lot of the decision making process is you know, it, it, uh, uh, the final stage is down to kind of culture and team fit. Is it a good thing to have an insight into that prior to even speaking? Or um, do you think that people should leave that to the telephone conversation? It's a rather convoluted question. Which no, no, I understand. People so. use videos in their uh, portfolio. <laughs> um, I, I mean, yeah. I, the, the more the more that I can I can review first, the better. Um, I think it depends on the candidate, right? You, you, some people are good interviewers, and some people are you know more nervy. Uh, some people are more formal, um, and depending on who's hiring, uh, they have different preferences too. Um, I mean, I you know the the process with reply um, is a mixture. Um, you know, I. I the, one of the startups that I worked for that I mentioned before, my, my hiring process was going for a beer and, and that was that was it. Um, it really it really does depend what the, what they're looking for. And, and I think if you feel that you're most likely to come across as your best self with a video, um, then I would take the chance to do that because yeah, looking through uh, CVs and portfolios and seeing something like that to stand out, you know, that could be something that really makes the difference. Yeah. Um, I think it also shows initiative. 
Um, but if you think that you'll have a better uh, perception, a better um, impression on someone by talking directly, um, then I definitely wouldn't discount someone that hasn't done something like that. Mm. You know, um, it, yeah, it, it depends. I think everyone knows themselves best. Yeah. Well, I think it's important to push your personality um, through the application process, through your CV, through LinkedIn, because that seems to have been lost now. You know, people write in a, a even in the creative industry, which it, it really struck me how little people spoke about themselves and their passion and their mm -hmm. enthusiasm and, and, and their journey into it. You know, it's uh, hobbies and interests, reading, socialising, cinema. You know, you want people to put their pet projects on there, the things that make them tick, because that is a huge differentiator, particularly in something as creative as, you know, UX and UI, right? I 100% agree with that. I think, yeah, hobbies and interests. Um, I mean, there's, I, I, I forget who who uses the, um, the saying, I think it was a Richard Branson saying, but it's the idea that um, you, you can't uh, you can't motivate someone, but you can inspire someone that's already motivated. Um, and I I think that's been my hiring um, strategy from the beginning, is that you hire motivated people and you find a way to inspire them to, to do something. So having hobbies and interests that show a broad range of respect for different areas and different things, um, the more of a the more of a geek you can be, right, uh, the better. If, if you, you know, I always think that, you know, the kind of geeky term, the, I, I hate that some people don't uh, like that term. I think if, if you've got deep knowledge in something, even if it's completely irrelevant, all it is is additional to who you are, yeah. right? Um, and so every opportunity to show that is, for me, something that stands out. I will, I will jump at a CV that's got an additional area of hobbies and interests that just go completely off the rails, because I think this person is motivated and they have the interests and they just need to be shown the things that, that are helpful from my perspective to, to make them really, you know, get where, get where they, they could be. Okay. Um, and, you know, finally, for um, those that are looking to get into to, to UX or those that are looking to further themselves uh, in, in UX design, is, is there any kind of um, sources of information or inspiration that, that, that you can draw on and point them in? Anything that they should be researching? Any kind of uh, good websites, blogs, videos, books, aggregators? Um, so I wouldn't I wouldn't give something specific right now. Um, I I think it's probably worth saying that you know if, if you're if you're watching this, then you know you're you're already aware of the amount of content that's being produced right now. Right, there's there's a lot of interesting content with a lot of very smart people that have downtime, um, and so yeah, there's a lot of uh, webinars and a lot of content that uh, is you know really interesting and, and hearing from people that maybe we wouldn't have heard from before. Mm. Um, so I think, yeah, have a look around, um, register for some webinars, uh, you know, learn some, learn some new things and, uh, yeah, take this time to, um, to see everything that's been produced because there's a lot. Okay. Now this isn't a shameless plug, but I did see that you'd done your own webinar recently. Is that right? I did. Yes. Yes. It was on design ops. Okay. So do you want to give yourself a shameless plug? <laughs> sure, yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I very recently uh, I did a I did a webinar um, via a live link on Eventbrite. Uh, it is on uh, why design ops is essential for um, for business. Uh, it touches on some of the points that we talked about earlier. Actually, um, the increased use of uh, design systems and how important those are, um, as well as a couple of examples of uh, tools that I use that I think um, if you're not using something like that or an equivalent, then uh, you're probably missing out on, on a few efficiencies that can make a big difference. So uh, if that sounds like something that could be useful for uh, making the most of a remote and distributed team, um, then yeah, no, definitely check it out. You can, you can find it on my LinkedIn profile. Awesome. Well, look, uh, we're approaching your bailout time so thank you very much indeed for for taking the time i think we've done 50 minutes um 
it's been incredibly uh, insightful. I'm hoping that some of the content, if not most of it, certainly coming from you, is going to help people in our networks. Um, good luck. Obviously, we'll stay in touch. Stay safe. You too. Um, and we'll catch up soon. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time, Alex. Yes. See you, man.